So today, I'm picking up where I left off last week. The week before that, I was in uh, uh, Romans 7, and I covered the last uh, passage of that about uh, just Paul's struggle with the flesh and the things that he wanted to do, he doesn't do, and the things that he shouldn't do, he does. And then the first part of Romans, we talked about there's no condemnation now for those who are in Jesus Christ and how he set us, set us free from the, the law of sin and death and uh, for you know, now the, the power of the Holy Spirit that has come upon us that is giving us strength uh, to overcome these things, right? And, um, and he talked about how if you want to be an overcomer, then you've got to do things that please the Spirit, amen, uh, and, uh, and uh, not the flesh. So the, the, the battle, the struggle we have goes on between the flesh and the spirit, the flesh and the spirit. So that's why the, the, the spirit has the, is stronger than the flesh, but we still have that free will, and that struggle goes on. But now, through the Lord Jesus Christ, again, we can become overcomers. Man, so, um, and then he talks about we're adopted now. We're adopted sons and daughters of, of God, right? So we are children of God. We are sons of God. Um, and that gives us uh, the hope of eternal life because we are in Christ and Lord has adopted us and, it, uh, and we are so again we are children of God and then in verse 17 says and if children then we're heirs heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him so and then in verse 18 if we'll stand Romans 18 I'm going to read Romans 18 through 26 and I'm going to be speaking out of that. Okay, So, provided that we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. For the creation eagerly awaits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. Amen? God's sons are God's children. When we are called to glory we're going to be revealed, right, as being called home. And that's what, you know, we're, we're, the sufferings that we're going through, everything we talked about here just a few minutes ago, the sufferings we're going through are nothing compared to the glory that is going to be revealed to us, right? We have glory to wait for. That's the hope that we have. For the creation eagerly awaits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. For the creation is subjected to full futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in the hope that the creation itself will also be set from free from the bondage of corruption into the glorious freedom of God's children. So even creation, we're, 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 we're suffering as, as men and women. We're suffering because this is not where we want to be. This is not how we want to live. And the earth is suffering because of the curse of it also. So it groans as well. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. And not only that, but we ourselves, we have the spirit of the first fruits, which is the Holy Spirit of God. We also groan within ourselves, eagerly awaiting for the adoption, for the redemption of our bodies. So we've been adopted. So now the adoption, the, the fulfilling of the adoption is waiting when he calls us home. We're, we're anticipating that. We're, we're, we're thinking about that. Lord, how long before we're fully adopted we're in, in glory with you? Now, in this hope we were saved. Yet hope that is seen is not hope because he hopes for what is sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patience. In the same way, the Spirit also joins to help in our weakness because we do not know what to pray for as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes with us with unspoken groanings. So even, even God, you know, the Holy Spirit of God is groaning. We're groaning. The earth is groaning because with the anticipation of him calling us to glory. And it's, it's evident now, it's more than anything, and I'm going to get into that, but these are the things that, that, we're, that we're feeling now. The groaning, uh, of the, 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 of like, a, like a woman in, in childbirth, where she's writhing and groaning and groaning. The earth is that. We are too. Every, every, this whole creation is groaning for the coming of the Lord. Amen? Lord, we love you, God. Speak through me. Speak to us, Father. For your honor, for your glory, God. Show us the anticipation that we have for you, God, the groaning and the suffering that we're going through right now is nothing compared to your glory, Father. And help us 
understand that, help us wrap our, our heads, our hearts, and our minds around that, God, is just, it's something is greater for us. While we're here, we're suffering. Lord, we're suffering, God, but we know that you have something better for us, Father. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please be seated. So, Paul was no stranger to suffering in this passage, and he explains some of his reasoning. The sufferings that he experienced would be insignificant considering the glory that's going to come later. That's what he's saying. I'm going through this thing, that thorn in the flesh. You know, he's been, he was beaten, he was whipped, he was capsized, he was bitten by a viper. He was, you know, he, he did without. He suffered a lot, this man did. But he said, these things that I'm going through are nothing compared to the glory that I have coming to me later. So creation also itself is suffering. Just as Adam, Eve, and the servant were recipients of the curse after the fall, right? So was the earth. So they were cursed. When God created the earth, God created man, he created it perfectly, perfectly. Everything was symbiotic. I think that's the term for it, where everything like uh, gets along with each other. Everything works together good. There's no issues. It just, life flows like it's supposed to. That's how he created it, just perfect, right? So then Adam and Eve sinned, and they were cursed, and the earth was cursed. Creation, everything was cursed. So rather than me remaining the perfect paradise that God intended, Creation is now in bondage, groaning like the woman in labor to produce fruit and be productive. So again, that's what's happened to this world. That's why we live in this. It's a fallen world. Amen? It's because of the decisions that Adam and Eve made. It's the decisions of that man and that woman who created this fall. And that's why we suffer. So God created a perfect heaven and earth. Everything was created perfect. But man came along and messed it up. And as believers... We groan as well, waiting for the time when God will redeem us fully, when he's going to call us home, and that's good. We're, he, we're done. The ticket's been paid. We're on our way. God's plan is in action. So God's adoption of us and our redemption is beginning. That's what we're feeling now. That's why this world is, is, is turning the way it is, because this is it. The earth is groaning. People are groaning. Humanity's groaning. Everything is groaning. The Spirit of God is groaning because he wants God to fulfill his promise. So the anticipation and the insurance of this reality is our hope in the meantime. Amen? You know, just go with me on this. It's, it's, it's powerful, the, this chapter here. So in verse 18, our text reminds us that one of the most fundamental truths of the Christian life, and the truth is this, is we're not home yet. So it's never going to be perfect here. We're never going to have the perfect government. We're never going to have the perfect dollar. We're never going to have the perfect earth. Nothing is going to be perfect while we're here. Yeah, right? That's how it is. While we wait to be delivered from this world, we need to remember that we're living in a world that is under a curse. Amen? The earth was cursed. As a result of that curse, there's a lot of groaning and turmoil everywhere taking place. In the middle of all this, though, it's easy for some of us to become discouraged and want to give up, right? It's kind of scary, kind of scary, you know, especially for young people. They're thinking, you know, I've got a, a, a life to live. You know, what's my life going to be like? You know, is it going to be short? Is it going to be long? Where the older ones were thinking, Lord, I'm tired of this already, man. My knees hurt. My back hurts. You know, I'm, I'm just, when am I, you know, we need to take us home so we can have a perfect body. Right? So yeah, there's all that stuff that's going on. We read about it in the papers and the news. We, you know, Instagram, all these kind of things. are just how bad everything is getting. And that's true. Because before that, it's got to be that way. But glory is coming. Amen? So the, the thing that we have to understand is, what side of glory am I going to be on? When this comes, when judgment comes, when God calls us home, when everything, you know, takes place, which side of glory am I going to be on? Am I going to be stuck on this side? Am I still living in the flesh? Because the Bible says if we still live in the flesh, we don't have the Spirit of God. Amen? So we got to get right with God. we got to get right with God. we got to stay right. Are we going to be perfect? No. We're not going to be perfect. But the thing is, we get up every morning and say, Lord, get me through this, God. I want to change. And when it makes time to come, come to, comes time to make a decision, make the right decision. We, we know that, right? We, we know that. We know that this is bad. Then we do it, and we say, I'll get back right later. But sometime, maybe, it's not going to come back later. Amen? Sometimes it, it might not happen. So do the right thing, as painful, as hard as it is. And some of us are those kind of personalities where we just, I'm, I'm going to do this, I'm going to get through this. It might, might not be the right time. Amen? we got to listen to God's Spirit. we gotta, we got to be sensitive to His Spirit. And how do we do that? We can't have a hard heart. And our heart, hard, 
harder and harder takes place because we start drifting away and we get colder and colder. And pretty soon those things that used to bother us don't bother us anymore. Those things are just, yeah, it's okay, it's no big deal. It's just another one of those things. We have to stay sensitive to God's spirit. We have to stay sensitive to his calling, amen, to the direction he's calling us to. Because if we don't, we're going to walk right into a trap. Amen? So listen, if there's one thing that this passage is going to teach us is that the spirit-filled life is one of perseverance. Amen? It's perseverance. The word perseverance means devotion. It means dedication. It means steadfastness. It means you, you take a stand. No. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Amen? That's what we, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. It's not going to be a little bit of this. It's not going to be a little bit of that. Well, maybe we can find it compromised. It's not going to be that way. We compromise. We open the door to Satan, and he comes in, and he starts wrecking our life. Amen? We compromise just that little bit. We give him that little chink in our armor. That 22 round that finds that first place right there where the vest creases, that's going to kill you. We got to, the full armor of God, we got to keep that on. The helmet of salvation, right? The breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the word of the, the spirit, right? The, the, the shoes of, of peace. And, and we, we've got to put, our, put that stuff on. In our lives, a lot of us do it, have to do it every day. That's the only way we're going to make it. And it's the opposite of giving up. You don't give up. You suit up. You don't give up. You suit up for the fight. You don't give up. In fact, the Spirit of God gives hope to, to us during troubling times in our lives. That's when it does. This passage here describes a struggle that's going on and in and around us, all of us, every day. So he's going to share three areas of our life that we need to have in the middle of a devastated earth that we live in. The first one is creation groans, and that's in verses 19 through 22. For creation eagerly awaits with anticipation for God's Son to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to futility, frustration, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in the hope that creation itself will also be set from the bondage of corruption into the glorious freedom of God's children. So it's not creation's fault. They, they, were, they were living a happy life. The animals in the kingdom, the water, the, every, every, the, everything got along like they were supposed to. Man and woman got along. Everything was right. Man sinned and everything fell apart. Now they were cursed. Now there's earthquakes. You know, now there's tornadoes. Now there's all this stuff that's going on. And there, even the, the creation is thinking, if it can, what happened? This isn't how it's supposed to be. It's not how it's supposed to be. This is not how God created us. Mankind, this is not how God created us. But that's what's happening now. So even they're subjected to the curse. And now they're waiting for us to be called so they can be made right with God also. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. Right? So here, the word groan means here to sigh. <sighs> <sighs> right? It has the idea of one who groans under a burden. You're carrying something. It's just like, <sighs> you're gutting it out. And I, ne I never got to go in, to, back in the days when we had kids, we couldn't go in with our wives. Now you guys can, but we can't. So I, we had to wait outside, pacing back and forth, you know, biting our fingernails while she's in there groaning and grunting. So I never got to see that. And I, not that I would want to, but I'm, you know, it's just, the, you see pictures of now where they're, just, they're sweaty, they're just screaming and hollering, I hate you, I hate you. And, and I, I didn't want to hear that, right? <laughs> You know, why did you do this to me? Why did you do this to me? Oh my God, we were both there. So this is the image that's used to describe creation, right? It's just, it's, it's, it's groaning. Creation came into the curse again, not by its own doing, but because of the sin of Adam. Because Adam chose to walk in rebellion to the clear command of God, all creation has been thrown under this curse now. And this verse describes creation as groaning and writhing like a woman in the throes of childbirth. Amen. Again, that's something that, that's, I, uh, I wouldn't want to go through that. So the results of that curse are plain to see. Earthquakes, tornadoes, hurricanes, the pandemic, worldwide violence, lawlessness, political unrest, a divided nation, hatred, social unrest, moral decay. We see all those things. Right? And that's what happened because of the curse. It's gotten worse and worse because creation, the, 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 we, the populations are growing. They're, they're moving into places where nobody was before. They're changing things that hadn't been changed before. So all this is overtaking the whole world, amen, the whole of creation. And even in the middle of creation's plan, pain, though, it still lifts its voice to God and the praise for his majesty and glory. You'll see that in the, in the Psalms, right? The Psalms, how it just, it just the, the majesty and the glory of God, how it just, just acknowledges and 
you know, just awesome experience of God. And also now in creation's expectation, verses 19 and, 20, 21, 19 and 21. For the creation eagerly awaits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed, that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage of corruption, corruption into the glorious freedom of God's children. Okay, so here's what these verses tell us. That creation itself expects to be delivered from the curse that's been placed on it. This word eagerly awaits in verse 19, it's like an image of somebody standing on their tiptoes straining to see something. Like, I remember when we took, my kids were little, and we went to Disneyland, and you know how they have that parade where Mickey and Goofy and all of them come down, and they're, you know, they're, they're, they're up like this, they're up like this, they're, they're looking and watching. That's how it is eagerly, they're, they're, they're waiting to see that. We're, the creation, all of us, are eagerly awaiting, Lord, when are you coming, God? When are you going to change everything? When are you going to make everything right, God? When, and we're eagerly anticipating it. It's just like we're on our tiptoes, watching and waiting. So too, creation yearns for that time when it will, in fact, be delivered from the ravages of the curse of sin, right? So that's what sin does. It ravages you. It wastes you. It, wa it just, it depletes you. It brings you down, amen? So if, you know, those are the consequences of sin. You know, you might think you get away from something a little bit here. You think, wait, well, hey, I'm gonna go confess and I'll be okay. But the consequences, it takes a physical, a spiritual, and emotional toil on you and your loved ones, amen? It does, it affects everybody. That thing you do, that thing you did, that thing you're thinking about doing will affect everybody. We have to think about that. Amen? So what we do, we bring dishonor to God. Because they're, okay, I thought you were a Christian. What's up with you? Well, you know, I, I, yes, you, we can. Yes, we have. God will forgive us. Again, but there's consequences for those things. Amen? God will forgive us, but there's consequences for those so too, creation yearns for that time when it'll be delivered from the ravages of sin. Now listen, delivered from the ravages of sin, when everything's going to be taken place. Now if you read Isaiah 11, 6 through 10, God will restore creation to its original beauty. That's the heaven that we're looking for, amen? He's going to restore creation to its original beauty, harmony, and peace. When Christ restores his kingdom on the earth, he will restore creation to a balanced, symbiotic relationship with nothing being hurt and destroyed. If you read that, it's the lion, right? and the lamb, and it's how the child will play near a, like, a, like a cobra's hole and not get struck. All those things are going to be, that's how perfect it was. That's how perfect God created it. So God's going to make that thing perfect again, where we're going to have that relationship with everything else, where everything's going to be right with God. Amen. That's what, with what if you read that, 11, uh, if you, Isaiah 11, 6 through 10. That's how, I, when I read that, it's just, you know, maybe you knew it. And I, I, I remember pictures of it where the lion and the lamb are sitting there in peace and, and, and it says the lion's going to start eating grass now instead of devouring the animals. So all these things are, are, are something amazing that's going to take place. That's the perfect earth. That's the perfect heaven. The second thing is this. The Christian, we groan in verses 23 and 25. And not only that, but we ourselves who have the Spirit as the first fruits, we also groan within ourselves, eagerly awaiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Now in this hope, we are saved. Yet hope that is seen is not hope because who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly await with, it for pa with patience. So it's, again, it's our agony. Along with creation, we too as children of God groan. Paul is speaking of our desire to be free from this mortal, sinful body. He mentions the first fruits of the Spirit. He's writing about the indwelling Holy Spirit of God in our life. When we repented from our sins, when we were baptized in Jesus' name, the Spirit of God moved into our spirit. Amen? We become a temple of God. The Holy Spirit is in us now. For one, in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. And we, were all, we were all were made to drink from one spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. And Romans 8, 9. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If in fact the Spirit God of, of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. Amen. He worked in us in such a way that we begin the process of seeing sin like God sees sin. The Spirit of God made us sensitive to sin in us, within us, and around us. Because of that, we're afflicted now. Amen. We're afflicted by the sins that we commit and the sins of the word. We're afflicted by that. 
That's where Paul's talking about, man, wretched man that I am. Who's going to deliver me from this death? Amen? That's what it is. That's what we struggle with. We're afflicted with that. And that's what we have to fight the good fight. Amen? We have to stay in the fight. Amen? It's a spiritual war. It's not something that we can see and put our hands on. Amen? It's a spiritual thing. And that spiritual thing wants to come in and tear our soul apart. He wants to remove that Holy Spirit. He wants our, our heart to become so hard that the Spirit of God has no room in us anymore. We're dead to Christ because we live in sin. If sin doesn't bother you, you have a serious spiritual problem. And if you can witness sin and it doesn't affect you, something is not right in your heart. Amen? You see something wrong and you know it just, it, it, oh man, you know, how, how do I tell them? Well, you know, sometimes you just got to be straight out. That's because you're doing this. And other times you got to say, sit down, let me, look, let me tell you how this works. And you explain the gospel. You explain how salvation works and why we need salvation. Amen? But if it's a believer, and, and, you know, hey dude, this, you're whacked because of this. And, you know, if they, have a, if they have a spirit for God, a heart for God, they'll take the counsel and say, you know, you're right. i got to get right. And all this serves to produce within us as a believer a sense of longing. Of longing. We want to be delivered from the sinful mortal body. And regardless of what anyone tells you, your flesh and my flesh has not been, this is not saved. It's a corruptible body. Amen. It's going to end up corruption. Corruption means, like, you know, uh, decomp decomposition. You know, it's going to, it's food for the worms. We're all going to end up that way. One way or another, we're all going to end up, this body is not going to go anywhere. Only a glorified body, when God, you know, glorifies it will. But this body here, it's not going to be it. It's depraved and wicked as it ever was. And we saw that in Romans 7, 18, 25, when Paul was crying out, wretched man that I am, who's going to deliver me? The things that I want to do. He had conflict, he had tension in his life. So, wouldn't it be a blessing if you never again had a wicked thought. Yeah. A wicked act. Sinful attraction or lust. Yeah. Yeah, Lord. Man, I don't, I don't want to do that, God. Why, why does this happen to me? It's because you're, you're a human being. You're a man. You're a woman. And those things happen to us. And that, again, it's the decisions that you make. Lord, I know I shouldn't be doing that. Don't do it. Well, just no, not even just that one little time. Because, again... You do it once, you keep doing it, you keep doing it, you keep doing it. After a while, it's just like, well, nothing happened. No thunderbolt came out of the sky, nothing happened. But there's other things that are happening. Your heart is getting hard, and there's consequences for that. And here's our anticipation in verses 24 and 25. Now, in this hope we were saved, yet hope that is seen is not hope, because he who so hopes, who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly await for it with patience. Paul writes, in this hope we are saved. In this hope we are saved. So what does that mean? Hope in the Bible is an entirely different word than it means in our world today, right? The people in this use the word hope as if they're saying, I wish, I want. Well, hopefully it will. No, maybe the rain won't. Be, maybe this, it's just like, I, I wish and I hope that we can all do better. When the Bible says or uses the word hope, it's an action word based on a conviction. Amen? Instead of a hope being a fond wish or desire, biblical hope is a deep, settled knowledge grounded on the promises of God. We are saved by faith in the promise of God that tells us that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen? We have that promise. Once we surrender our lives, once we're baptized in Jesus' name, the Bible says you, if you repent and you're baptized in Jesus' name, your sins will be forgiven. Your sins will be washed away and you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. That's what that means. If we have been saved in Jesus' name, if we have been baptized in water, we've come out of there clean and, and a new creature in Christ, we've been saved. We have to say, we, now, salvation is not unto works, but now, let me show you my faith by my acts, right? They say, well, it's all by faith. It's all by, yeah, you're absolutely right. I have to have faith in God. But I also have to show him that I believe in him, that I love him, that I am a child of God. So my faith now becomes actions, right? In, in works. It's not works. It's a work of, it's like, it's serving. If serving is a work, then we're all dead. Because we have to serve God. We've got to serve God. We've got to please God. Amen? How do we do that? By, you know, right living, by worshiping God, by reading scriptures, by, you know, fanning the flame of the Holy Spirit of God. Amen? By loving one another, forgiving. You know, on, even on the freeway, you forgive people that cut you off. Or vice versa. Okay? It's a conviction that salvation comes through faith in the shed blood and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the conviction that we have. That's our belief. 
That's what, you know, we stand on. That's my conviction, is the Lord Jesus Christ hung on a cross, shed his blood for my sins, so my sins would be washed away. And he was resurrected, and my hope is when I'm called home, I'll be resurrected in his presence also. Amen. It's a sure knowledge that one day our Lord will come for us and will take us to heaven. Amen? Amen. It's the sure knowledge that we will be changed from these wretched creatures that we are, we were made like him. That's our conviction, is no, knowing that, that we will be changed. The Bible says in the, in the twinkling of an eye, in the blink of an eye, when he calls us home. 1 Corinthians 49 says, just as we are now like earthly man, we will someday be like the heavenly man and woman. What I'm saying, dear brothers and sisters, is that our physical bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of God. These dying bodies cannot inherit what will last forever, 51. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed, amen? That's what it is, we're transformed. When, we, when God calls us home, we're transformed, we're changed. It's like a worm becomes a butterfly. How does that come? It's a new supernatural God thing, from this physical thing to that spiritual thing, amen? It'll happen in a moment in the blink of an eye when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And we who are living will also be transformed. For our dying bodies, verse 53, must be transformed into the bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Amen? That means forever body. Instead of immortal where there's a death sentence, we're now immortal. Then, when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? No more. It's gone. Amen? We are resurrected. We've been transformed into a new, new creature in Christ. And then also here in um, the second one, John 3, 1, 3, it says, I look how great a love the Father has given us that we should be called God's children. And we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it didn't know him. Dear friends, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet been revealed. So in the first part of that, uh, of, of eight, 18, when we're going to be revealed, that's what he's talking about. We know that when we, he appears, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Amen? Again, that's what I want. I hope that's what you want. So I'm going to do whatever I can here. I'm trusting in God. I'm, 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 I'm just allowing the Holy Spirit of God to have his way in my life. Yes, I still say stupid things. I still do dumb things. But I, Lord, correct me. They get fewer and fewer, but then sometimes they come back. And that Satan, he's come chasing you around, trying to stab you with something. And again, it's, just, it's, a, it's going to be a battle. It's going to be a battle while we're on this earth. Amen? So don't think for one second that, whew, okay, I'm good. I'm just waiting for him now to call me home. Uh-uh. We, we, we've got to struggle for the rest of our life, as long as we live in this mortal body. So, we that are saved, grown to be free from these bodies. Amen? Lord, in our, in our prayers, we're groaning, God, help me through this, God, help me through this, God, deliver me from this trial, deliver me from this temptation, deliver me. Those are groans, we're groaning to God, help me, God. I, I don't want to do this, God. Every time I do this, I go there, this is what happens, and don't go there. Don't do that thing, don't open the door. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? We long to be remade in the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. And one day, this sinful flesh will breathe its last, and we will be remade into the image of our Savior, Jesus Christ. This was the heart of David when he wrote this in Psalm 17, 15. As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. When I awake, I shall be satisfied with your likeness. When we open our eyes in the blink of an eye, there we are. I made it. <laughs> I made it. We made it. Amen? Amen? This is the heart of every born-again saint of God. Amen. Amen? The third thing is this. The Spirit groans in verses 26 and 27. In the same way, the Spirit also joins to help in our weakness, because we do not know what to pray for as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes to us with unspoken groanings. And he who searches the hearts knows the Spirit's mindset because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. This verse goes on to tell us that it isn't just creation and the Christian who are groaning in this present world. The Holy Spirit of God, our comforter, amen, also groans with us. Our helper. In Hebrews 4.15, he says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, 
but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Amen? The Spirit sustains us in verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. This verse teaches us that the Holy Spirit of God comes alongside of us as we travel through this harsh world and gives us a hand. Amen? He pick, picks us up. Walk with him. He, he, like my prayer is, God, if I fall and I slip, pick me up, Lord, and don't leave me behind. I, I, that's my prayer, God. Don't leave me behind, God. If you have to drag me, let, let me just hang on. But I don't, I don't want to be left behind. I don't. That's my prayer, God. Whatever it is, God, let me just let me cling to you. And we need the same down-to-earth basic help every day with us. Every day we need that. He knows our tendency towards evil, and he still helps us. He knows that we are prone to wander, and he still helps us. He knows that every, we often grow weary in doing well, and he still helps us. So the Spirit of God working in us helps us to do anything that we do that could be called good. Amen? It's a spirit, that's why stay, stay in tune, stay tender to his Spirit. Stay tender to his Spirit. We are weak and sinners, but he strengthens us so that we'll be able to, harry, to carry on to the glory of God. And he also speaks with us in verses 26 and 27 because we do not know what to pray for, as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with unspoken groanings. And he who searches the hearts knows the Spirit's mindset because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Here Paul makes a point about the Spirit's help. Because our sins and our tendency for evil, we're not always able to pray in the manner that is consistent with the perfect will of God. Right? I mean, so I mean, sometimes we're messed up and we come and we're trying to, okay, how do I find myself out of this one, Lord? What do I got to say? And what do I just, and that's when we're just, you know, we're, we're, we're battling, we're struggling. Sometimes we can do that. It's not always, you know, you're, you're coming to the Lord and you're just open and weeping. Sometimes like, Lord, I, I messed, I don't know what to do, God. I'm, I'm just, I'm torn. I'm torn because now your, your spirit is getting colder and harder because you're, you're fighting with that thing. And now you got to come in here. And when you're saying, Lord, I don't know what, what to do, he'll do it for you. He takes our prayers. We're often flawed and misguided, and he straightens them out. Who among us knows the perfect will of God in every matter? We don't. Who among us knows how to pray about everything we hear about? Who knows the mind of God better than God? Because he's God, he can translate our prayers out of the flawed, selfish language we use and into the perfect will of God. He can take those groans. He can take that stuff, and he can make it right with him. As long as we come with a heart, we're groaning to God, we're crying out to God, we're pleading with God, please God, don't let me wander away, don't let, don't let me be lost, God, don't let go of me, God, don't turn your back on me, I'm crying out to you, Father. So those groans, those cries for help, God will take those and make things right out of it. Amen. And it isn't just prayer that he's talking about. Prayer is just using that as an illustration. The Holy Spirit of God is actively involved in all aspects of our life, Amen. That's what he's, he's there for. He dwells in us. He's, he's, he's an active participant in our life as we make our way through this crazy world. That's why we, we, we feel convicted because he's, he's convicting us. He's saying, no, that's not right. You know that's not right. And you go there, then you feel bad because he's, he's grieving now. He grieves when you do something like that. Amen? Amen? He is who Jesus said he would be. He's our helper in John 14, 16. So let's not grow weary in our Christian walk through this world. There will be times when it's hard to worship. It's hard to pray. It's hard to work of the God, uh, the work of God. But we have that helper, amen? Lord, help me, God. Help me, God. Help me, Lord. Help me through this. We have the one with us who always rises up to meet the challenge, and he's going to empower us to walk in victory. we got to believe that. It's him. It's not us. I can't do anything on my own. You can't do it on your own. No matter how much you work out, no matter how much you try, no matter how healthy you are, it's, you know, it's, it's not. If you're not right spiritually, we're not going to make it. It's only with his spirit that dwells in us, that burns, amen, that, that shows us and convicts us. Amen. Well, we have victory. So here are my final thoughts. Whoever said that the walk of faith was an easy walk didn't tell you the truth. And I'm going to say this, even though it isn't always easy, it's never impossible, amen? As long as we have breath in our lungs, as long as we have our mind where we can cry out to God, yes, he will make things right for us. Will we suffer? Yes, we're going to suffer. Will we groan while we're here? Yes, we still groan while we're, while we're here. Will there be times that we fail and feel like quitting? Yes, it happens. Yes, it happens. This body's weak. This body's weak. It caves into these things. We, you know, I'm going to throw in the gloves. I'm going to throw in the towel. I'm going to give up now because it just, it's too much for me. No, it's not. No, it's not. When, when we are weak is when God makes, shows his strength in our lives. Amen? 
That's why we have to understand that. He wants to get rid of all that stuff in you. He wants to get rid of all that stuff that causes you to turn away from him or drift away from him. He's got to take all that stuff off you. So finally, he'll get to that man and woman who needs him, who desperately needs him. When all that stuff that you depended on, when all these people that you thought were there, you depended on, when all that's gone, it's just you and him. Amen? We're going to have to stand before him at the great white throne of judgment. It's just going to be you and him. Nobody else to uh, advocate for you. But yeah, this guy did that, but she did this, but you know what she really did? No, it's just you and him. Amen? And you're going to have to answer to him for what you did. You have to work out your own salvation. I can't do it for my kids. I pray for my kids. I ask God, please, God, have mercy for them. Touch their hearts, God. Turn their hearts back to you. But it's on them. I've done what I can do, and I'm still going to keep, keep doing that. But it's up to each one of us to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Amen? Every one of us, we're going to be accountable only to God. That's the bottom line. Where's your heart at today? Where's your heart been? You know, are you still out there playing the, the field? Are you still out there testing the waters? Well, how much can I get away with? Well, if, how, how, if I go here, can I still come back? If I go there, can I, can I, I know God will, you don't know. You don't know. You don't know. If you try it, that, that might be the time. You just don't know. Don't gamble with your salvation. Amen? We know the right thing to do. We know the right way to live. Do we always do it? No. But the thing is, you keep pressing forward. You keep pressing forward. You don't fall back. You keep pressing forward. Amen? Amen. Remember, we have the Holy Spirit of God with us, okay? and he empowers us to remain diligent and committed as we travel toward glory. Amen? We have the Holy Spirit of God, and we got we to get, get up and fight the good fight. Like Paul said, you know, I, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race, and now, you know, now I'm going to get the glory, the uh, crown of glory that God has promised to those who love him. Amen? Yes, that's going to happen, every one of us. We, we got to keep fighting the good fight. Amen? We got to keep fighting that good fight. It's a spiritual war. It's a spirit. You can't duke it out like he said. You're just flailing your arms at what? No, you don't do that. You, it, you're not ever going to hit anything. This is a spiritual battle that we have. Amen? When man fell, this world was cursed along with him. But this is a glorious news as well. When mankind is liberated from corruption, this world will be liberated as well. God had to subject man's world to man's fate, but God has also subjected man's world in hope. Amen? So everything is going to be made right. Creation will experience a glorious hope of living forever with man, of being completely and perfectly made new. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. Again, Isaiah eleven six ten. 10. That's what we have to look for. That's what we have to long for. Amen? When we're called home, like in a twinkling of an eye, God is going to make the perfect earth, the new Jerusalem, where we're all going to dwell with each other, animals and snakes and vipers and everything else is still out there. It's going to, it's going to be heaven. Amen? Amen? But we have to stay faithful. We have to stay faithful. And we know what we're fighting about, against. We know we're, who we're fighting with. Amen? Again, it, again it's, it's Satan. And that's who we have to you know, put on the full armor of God. We've got to fight the fight, the shield of faith, the sword of the Spirit, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness. Amen? All those things, the belt of truth. The shoes of peace. Let's stand. Amen. There's a lot going on. There's a lot going on. And I hope that this, this last passage opened your eyes. Actually, you know, chapter 8, even chapter 1, from beginning from chapter 1, Paul lays out how man just became depraved. And, you know, it just, he just he left him alone and you, you deal with it yourself, and everything just fell apart, right? Again, and that's why we suffer. We suffer because of depravity. We suffer because of sin, amen? God didn't design it this way. Man had that choice. We still do. Every one of us has that free will. Every day, we, we choose whether we're going to serve him or not, whether we're going to follow him or not. We do that every, sing, every single day. We do that. So that, you know, again, get your heart right with God. Get your mind right with God. It, it's a transformation of your mind. It's a battlefield of the mind. And we got to get our mind and our heart connected with God. So today, the altar is open. You know, again, I, I want that glory. I, 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 want, I want to reach glory. And I know while I'm here, I'm, I'm still fighting. Every one of us is fighting. Every one of us has slipped and fallen. Every one of us will slip and fall. But again, don't give up. Don't give up. You know, stand on your feet more than falling down. Eventually, you're going to fall less, and you're going to stand up more. 
Amen? That's how life is. We learn that. We, we exercise the spiritual muscle where now it says, no, -uh, I'm not going to do that. I, 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 I'm not going to do that. And some of us here have done that. There's some things in our life that we have totally, totally just cut off. No more do I feel the desire to this. No more do I have the desire to that. No more do I do. I, I, it's just, it's, it's instant like that. But there's other little things in there. That one thing, that one thing that it, it just rears its ugly head every once in a while, that is a thing that you have to call heaven on, on the Holy Spirit of God. Say, burn it, God. Take care of it, Father. Take care of it. And you've got to be an active participant in that also. I'm like, okay, I'm just going to stand back and watch you. No, I'm here. I'm groaning, God. I'm praying. I'm crying out to you, Father. I'm taking a stand. I'm taking a stand. You know, as weak as I am, Lord, I know that you're going to help me. You're going to straighten me out. I depend on you. I believe on you, God. Again, let him be your helper. Don't try to do it on your own. Amen?